Welcome to New Release Review, part of the Movie Friends podcast. My name is Seth. Today we're talking about Oppenheimer from 2023. Maybe you've heard of it. So we will be discussing spoilers. So if you haven't seen Oppenheimer and you're listening to this, please don't do that. Um, I don't know why people do that. It kind of drives me crazy. But here's your warning. So spoiler warning, do not listen to this if you haven't seen Oppenheimer. And I'm joined (laughs) today by good friend Mark, but I'm going to let him introduce himself. So Mark, why don't you take it? Yo, 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 it's your boy, the Mark Rob, a.k.a. Sean Matt Love, a.k.a. Pacey Twitter, a.k.a. 4 Eye Willie, a.k.a. Spike Singleton, a.k.a. <laughs> Thick Moranis, because, honey, we don't give a fuck about them kids, a.k.a. AKA Marco Calrissian, a.k.a. <laughs> a.k.a. Paul Car- Mark Blot. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> Seth, how's it going, buddy? How's it going? That, that was a good one. AKA the name that I know you by, Silly Goose Magoo. Yes, yes, yes. What's going yeah. on, baby? Nothing really. I mean, I just came out of this movie and I felt like the theater should have had like a, a separate area for people who just watched Oppenheimer and aren't ready to like emerging to the world yet i was just walking around in the supermarket afterwards like i'm not ready for this <laughs> stop and think about what i'm what what all that meant and yeah anyway how are you doing i'm doing good so i i did i did official barbenheimer so oh, you, cool. it only counts as barbenheimer if you watch them both in the same day Correct. and so my my journey to Oppenheimer was very silly, but I will say you definitely need a, a decontainment area after leaving Oppenheimer because I was really kind of stuck on how do I feel? How do I think Nolan feels? I know what I saw, but what does it all actually mean? So yes. I, I fully get where you're coming from with like, how do you actually process and internalize this movie? Yeah, and I I still don't, like, part of me felt better, like, every minute that passed, I was like, oh, I think I like this movie more and more, and then as I started to think about choices that they made, I was like, I think I like this movie less and less, and so I'm (laughs) I'm in a very confused, like, headspace right now, like, you, you, you said, you said it well, I know what I saw, right, I'm not confused as, like, what the actual movie was, yeah. I think a lot of people have been really critical of Christopher Nolan for, you know, not taking a clear political stance in a lot of things. Yeah. Like... And here it was like, I, 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 I get it. You don't end a movie showing us like nuclear missiles flying through the air and say, and then... this was all good. Yeah, and like the guy who the guy who invented the shit is the good guy after all. Like, huh? Like right, right. So now I I actually think the greatest strength of this movie is its limitation in that Christopher Nolan does build neutrality for Robert Oppenheimer. Mm-hmm. And the idea is I think in generally speaking, if you just show the character and you try to have what we think is as little as bias as possible, show the character, show them and their strengths and their weaknesses and let the audience make a decision. And I think he does that very well, but I don't know how he actually feels about this person and what the actual, like this piece of art that he actually made. And so one of the most meta things that happened to me like in the screening was like, obviously, you know, there's no real spoiler. Like there's a bomb in the movie. Right. Uh, and so when the bomb, when the bomb goes off and all the scientists are clapping, Oppenheimer's kind of walking through the crowd, shaking hands, kissing toxic babies. Yeah. And the guy to the left of me started clapping along. Wow. And I was like, wow, and wow. I was like, yo, 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 yo. It's one thing if you're like in the moment, it's one thing if you're like significantly terrified that, you know, Russia or the Nazis are going to bomb you. Okay. But this is 2023, my guy. Like, why are you cheering along? And in that moment, I was like, 
I think Nolan wants to build neutrality, but what happens if it's on the other side of we have people in the audience who support nuclear weapons? And it's like, right, right, right. what the hell is going on? So that's like the thing where Dave Chappelle had a moment where people on set were laughing a little too hard. And he was like, what am I making here? You know, and like, yeah, caused him to kind of like spiral. And yeah, what is Nolan making here? And I, I, I feel like he's definitely going out of his way to justify and defend a lot of what Oppenheimer did while putting in ideas for not defending him. At yeah. one point, his wife says, uh, after, the, after his uh, previous engagement girlfriend died, uh, after she kills herself, she says, you can't commit the sin and then make us all feel bad for you. Yeah. Or like expect us all to feel bad for you. You know, when, when the repercussions or the consequences of your actions come about. And that felt pretty, you know, I think that Nolan is kind of blowing past that character in a lot of ways. She definitely feels like she's being used um, symbolically in a lot of ways, especially in that one scene where uh, her and Oppenheimer are like having sex in front of everyone in the interrogation yeah, the, room. Or the, you know, yeah, the, yeah, the one the yeah. wife kind of pitches it, yeah. Yeah, it was very interesting. Um, so it, it, it definitely felt like she was almost like a means to an end so that that line could be delivered. So that like yeah. that idea could be introduced to the story and to like understanding Oppenheimer as a whole because it's kind of like oh you feel bad oh well maybe you shouldn't have like made this bomb then <laughs> yeah and I think her I think the Florence Pugh character is definitely one of the the weaker parts of the movie and not because of her actual performance because no. this idea that you are trying to it does feel like he's trying to shoe in some kind of empathy for himself that it just didn't necessarily feel natural. And and also one of the things I felt was a little bit kind of cheap was, so I, like you said, like the idea that she, she kills herself. Well, in the movie, they're trying to pose it as she may have actually not, and that her death was set up and Oppenheimer is like pondering this. But then it's like, if this woman was supposedly like the love of your life, and you suspect that the federal government has something to do with her demise. So, so you're just going to ignore that and build like the bomb anyway. And sure. so it's like, you, you, you kind of want to pander to those, you, you know, you want to pander a little bit to the leftist groups that Oppenheimer claims he was a part of, mm -hmm. but then when he throws them kind of under the bus, there's no real kind of resolution for that. It just right. happens and kind of goes on. Right. And so I do think there's, there are definitely moments that, Nolan does kind of sacrifice to make you feel like you should have empathy for Oppenheimer. Um, and I think the biggest like kind of elephant in the room that they do, I don't think they navigate well. And I would assume our Japanese brothers and sisters would not think they navigate well is the idea that, okay, we, we see the bomb, we get the, you know, big explosion. We see Oppenheimer have this kind of moment of, quasi morality but we don't actually feel the effects of what the those you know the tragedy for the japanese people yeah. and so there's a scene where they're like spouting out numbers of how many people die when they hit how many people died you know years afterwards and you know he talks about it okay but it they kind of skirt it to where you talk about it you address it but there's no real actual kind of like uh, fighting against it. Like you don't really see him truly actually like have to deal with those feelings because those, like those are people that died, you yeah. know, th there's no coming back from that. But Oppenheimer gets to be the hero. Cause he, cause his wife does, doesn't shake a guy's hand at the end of the movie. Right. And I mean, I was curious as to how they were going to handle that going in because I had heard a few people say like, you know, it wouldn't be really be appropriate for them to show that. And I, I understand that. You don't need yeah. to show me people being vaporized. And I don't want to see that in this story. I don't need to see that. 
So, so I agree. But during that segment where someone is giving a presentation on, you know, the, st the statistics, they're also showing photos and all the people around Oppenheimer, they're like gasping and telling they're upset. And he just turns and like looks away. Like he just yeah. puts his head down. He, he, and he doesn't even, we don't even see him reckon Looking with at it. what's happening. It's something uh, I kind of laughed. You know, there was a joke going around about all animated films uh, have to include a panic attack scene. <laughs> yeah, and true. Th th there's definitely that throughout Oppenheimer where there's moments where it, like, you know, the screen around him gets fuzzy and you can hear like the noise swelling. And so clearly we're shown that he feels something, but we never see him really like reckon with it. And it felt, it did feel a little disrespectful in that scene where he doesn't even look. Like I get it. If Nolan doesn't want us as the audience to see it for whatever his artistic reasons are, but for Oppenheimer himself to not even look, that was like, that was a real choice. That was pretty, yeah, that was pretty intense. Um, yeah. As far <laughs> you said something about, you mentioned that it's possible that Oppenheimer's girlfriend, you know, played by Florence Pugh was targeted by the government. Did you get a moment to, at the end when Strauss is not confirmed and he asks for the names of the holdouts? <laughs> <laughs> and the guy says, oh, this guy, Kennedy, John F. Kennedy. I, I was like, wait a minute. Are we to believe this Strauss <laughs> held a grudge for so long that he organized like the killing of John F. Kennedy? I mean, they... Or were we supposed to, like, stand and cheer? Like, yes, that's our guy, JFK. <laughs> it, it, it's very similar to Dark Knight Rises when uh, John Blake is, is picking up the bag right. and, and, the, and the woman's secretary, you should go by your real name. Right. I like that name. Robin. Like, okay. <laughs> all right. All right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There, there were, you know, I... I'm pretty open about my feelings of Christopher Nolan. I, I, I put him in the same category as like Spielberg and Scorsese and it's men who love movies and their love of like movie making and tricks kind of can get in the way of just telling a story, you know? Yeah. And I, I think there's levels and degrees to that. Nolan seems so obsessed with never telling a story in order like, <laughs> he, <laughs> like he just adds should... like I, I in any contract i will not tell a story from start to finish i don't care yeah. what the context is i don't care if it helps i don't care if it confuses people and so there was a lot of things in there the whole scene with the apple at the beginning i was like this is the most christopher nolan things i've ever seen in a movie <laughs> But I, I looked it up. Apparently, Oppenheimer actually did try to poison his teacher with a poison. I mean, <laughs> these guys are real fucking sicko. Yeah, Not in a man. Good way. It didn't happen in the way that it happens in the film. Obviously, that was that was Nolan's yeah. little touch on history. Yeah, and it's funny you you compared him to those other directors. I was actually thinking when I left the theater about. Wes Anderson and Asteroid City mm -hmm. and it's funny how they both release in the same summer and these are kind of filmmakers who whether you like their movies or not they have a very distinct visual language to sure. all their films like sure. Nolan is interested in science and time for Wes Anderson when you look at his movies he's really interested in kind of like symmetry you know precision uh like balance in the frame but the biggest difference between Wes Anderson and Nolan is Wes Anderson is always committed to like emotionality within mm. within re relationships how they fail how they work and how they kind of like mend again and so with Ashwood City which I, I love like I was kind of having a moment of uh and I kind of talked about this on our episode that we recorded of I'm, I'm actually seeing beyond that now. Like mm -hmm. I'm looking at the matrix. I don't see the falling digits and codes. Yeah. I just see like 
what has actually happened with the characters. And so for me, like now I think I've kind of gone over the hump with Wes Anderson to where I can really focus on like, what is this actual story about? What is this, you know, what are these characters actually doing? And for Nolan, I think this movie is extraordinarily crafted. The sound design, um, the, the, the photography with the, with on film, I absolutely love, but I'm really trying to get beyond that. I'm really trying to get beyond even these performances, which I think all the performances are really great. And, you know, how do we kind of get to the core of what this movie is really supposed to be about? And so we have this kind of tortured genius who is now for the first time in his life clashing with morality. Um, But in that, we still don't, I don't really know how Nolan feels like if if Nolan wants us to kind of have empathy for these complicated people, I think there's nothing wrong with having that storytelling, but I think there's a little bit more ways to kind of go if you want to do that. Yeah. It it feels like, and you know, it, it could just be very true to life. I think both of us would admit that we're not like, Oppenheimer experts here. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I uh, did not go to school to study uh, atomic warfare. I did not yeah, do that. I do not know what the J and J Robert Oppenheimer stands for. <laughs> but like, you know, one of the biggest parts, points of the movie is Oppenheimer has this like duality. He has this history, right? Is he a communist or is he an American? Is he a pure scientist or is he a madman? Is he a war criminal or is he, was he just doing his duty? And it feels like they just show him flip flop so many times pretty easily. Like when, when he's, you know, trying to unionize and holding meetings and this and that. And then just in the very next breath, he's like, okay, okay, I'll talk to everybody. We'll stop it. And let me be part yeah. of your super team. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, I can build a bomb for you. Okay. Let me give, let me not give a fuck about this union anymore. Let's build this and, bomb. But show us, show us a little bit why someone who is communist leaning at least, right? Yeah. Why he suddenly feels the need to like change his entire life and move to the desert and like, Hey, I got a place out you know, out West we can use too. Like you guys can come to my house and do this. Um, yeah. Beyond, you know, the, obviously they bring up that he's Jewish and everything that's happening in Germany with the extinction of the Jewish people. But we don't, we don't see that. We just see him suddenly rapidly change his mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so that, that pivot is, is, is a little cheap. And, and actually the funny thing is, so in the film, Strauss played, I think pretty excellently by Robert Downey Jr. Sure. Like I think in a narrative sense, he's pitted as Robert's enemy. Yeah. And I mean, I think, you know, when he's trying to get him to remove his security clearance and that he can't really talk about the negative effects of, you know, just kind of everyone constantly building like the next biggest bomb, yeah. you know, that, that has merit, but at the same time, like his assessment of Oppenheimer is still pretty valid. And the idea that the moment that the government took your project away from you and the moment that your, your usefulness was now useless that's when you actually had that that bout of morality yeah. and when you could have had it when you know you were you know testing bombs you know or or even when there's kind of a moment to where they're fully unsure of how far the russians have kind of gone with their like actual progress of making the bomb and then it's that scene of where they kind of get information that oh they actually fucked up and so it's right. now it, the, now if you had the morality at that point, you could have had a sense of, well, the Russians, they may not be able to do it. Let's try to talk to them. So they just do not do it. They don't do that. They go full steam ahead to actually build it. So, you know, I I think the, I think his, I mean, you know, you can kind of have your kind of personal political beliefs, but you know, I just think that's kind of bullshit. So, and the, and the movie doesn't necessarily reckon with that at all. Yeah. 
And I will say, to to be fair, the pieces are there. Nolan puts the pieces there. And I think yeah. what people are frustrated about is that he just won't commit. Like, he won't commit to saying yeah. 100%. No, Oppenheimer was misunderstood, and look at how he was railroaded. And he also won't say, look, this guy tried to poison his teacher when he was in school. <laughs> yeah. He kind of betrays, you know, his, his friends and goes off to, like, he starts wearing, like, the military uniform and, like, it just feels like a lot of a lot of pieces are there. And over three hours, I feel like that's enough time to be a little bit more clear. But yeah. maybe, maybe the movie just isn't saying what I wanted to say, and so that's why I'm not seeing it. I, I'm not sure. Um, I mean... Maybe, look, but look, I, you know, I was not a, a physicist in World War II. <laughs> I, I, don't I, I was not. I was not a Jewish who had uh, my family members <laughs> killed by Nazis. So right. So I don't know what I would be doing. I do know. To me, you can't put this huge, dramatic, tense movie magic set piece in the middle of your movie which is the testing of the bomb right we're pulling yeah. out all of the the magic tricks from the bag the music is swelling you have the different people you have a little bit of comedy with him putting on sunscreen you have the countdown it's uh, every classic thing is all leading to this moment to get you hyped and get the audience drawn into this very moment to me yeah. that should have been the discussion of Hitler is now dead. Why are we doing this? Exactly. Like put the focus and the crux of the movie is that explore that decision more than just like a seven minute. Yeah. Cause he, like little he, scene. he goes from starting like unions to busting up a union against yeah. him. Yeah. That's, that's a fucking pivot. Yeah. And, but Nolan doesn't really want to talk about that. Right, like that's, right. Like that's that's pretty wild. That's pretty so, fucking wild. What did you think about the Trinity test scene? Oh, it was it was abhorrently breathtaking. Yeah. Like it was it was it was fully remarkably crafted. It did what it had to do when they dropped the sound on it and you just kind of witness it. Sure. And then you also get kind of Oppenheimer in that classic psycho shot of you're watching him now witness it. Yep. I think it all worked. I I can definitely see how for someone who is a tortured genius and who was a theorist, he has all these kind of inclinations of how things should go. And you're now seeing a theorist actually see what his theory looks like in real life. And it's abhorrent and it's gross. And it's deadly. And for me, it was kind of a totality of, I know how I personally feel about this guy. I know how I would like not do this and how I probably would have been in those leftist groups that was, that probably would have been considered a commie. Um, and so now I'm watching this guy kind of do this kind of devastatingly, you know, kind of gross act. And Full spectacle, Nolan on probably 10 out of 10, I would say, as far as I think for his entire career, when you look at kind of the scale of what Nolan wants to do with action and time and destruction and devastation, I think this is, I think it was probably all leading to this moment in his career. Mm -hmm. And you drop the bomb. And you just live in it. You live in the destruction. And you just live with those emotions. And so while the bomb is going off and the movie is silent, you're left with thinking of all this is really kind of crazy. And then you have to kind of parcel out wh where your mind's going to go with this. And then the, the, the big crash of the sound and you're brought back to the actual movie. Right. And so it, it, it's, I, I, 
I think it's probably the apex of his filmmaking career. Wow. Not saying not, not not saying this is the best movie he's done. Sure, sure. But the 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 faults of Nolan is that other than like pieces of Dark Knight and pieces of like Interstellar, he has a real hard time with building genuine emotion and getting emotion out of his characters. I think in that moment in that scene and the countdown leading to it, I think he channeled probably the best emotionality of his career. Wow. Wow. I was really struck with, it, it, it's going to seem, it's going to sound really strange <laughs> when it's this countdown to the bomb going off and they're all fairly certain they're not going to destroy the world with it, but maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe near zero near and zero they believe that they're in the correct blast zones and they this and that and everything it really it felt like a great moment for understanding why either someone with an addiction does what they do or someone who's doing something that is potentially very very self-destructive but they've become so focused on it yeah that accomplishing that thing is more important than destroying their life or the moral yeah. ramifications of it. Like if you, you know, if you're married and you, you fall in love with someone else and you're like, all I can think about, you know, is like having an affair with this person and you're, everything is pointing you in that direction or like, I'm going to like commit this crime or I'm gonna... yeah. <laughs> and it's almost like you just need to get, you just need to get it done. And then when it's over, then you'll deal with the fallout of it. Right. And yeah. that's what really struck me. And so it made me feel emotional, not for the war or for what happened, but just for mankind. And I was like, Oh, this is why people shouldn't have so much power because yes. their drive and their, their single vision can affect everyone on the planet you know Absolutely. if i if i become fixated on like eating an entire box of ice cream sandwiches because i have a hankering <laughs> i'm doing damage to myself yes. but if you know harry truman decides that we're going to drop nuclear bombs and this is the only way like if this is we just have to do this and when is the test going to be ready well it won't be ready well it has to be ready okay i guess it's going to be ready and now there's this huge storm don't worry, don't worry about the storm. Don't worry about it. We are doing this thing. And so I know that might be a strange <laughs> headspace to be in, but for that, I was like, this is, this is pretty great. No, I was it, a little it, disappointed with the visual of it just because Nolan had like played it up so much. And he's like, we didn't, you know, there's no CGI and it's all real. And I was like, okay. And then it was just like flames and stuff. I was like, I see this on a Burger King commercial for the Flame Girl Whopper. (laughs) I'm just, I'm I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to take away from there. Now Burger King, (laughs) hopefully Burger King doesn't give you the emotionality of the, of the, of the nuclear bomb countdown. Um, but, but no, like I, I, I think that, like I said, I think Nolan's really, Nolan really accomplished things in his in this movie in his career that he just kind of hadn't touched on now we i mean we talked about some of the faults uh yeah. and, and and even even like the testing site <laughs> they even skipped over you know the small displacement of native americans to that sure. land you know yeah let's yeah we like <laughs> like it, is, it never came up at all it was, it right. was like a one sentence blurb and right. so you know, there there are just certain things that, and you know, this is kind of the the trappings of filmmaking. You know, you have to make choices that is just going to sacrifice stories. Like, and there's no, kind of no way around it. And so, either you want to make Chernobyl or you want to make Oppenheimer. Yeah. And so, for Nolan, I think that this is probably. I don't know where his career kind of goes from here. Like, I don't know what the next thing is going to be. Um, are we going to get another genius torture white man who wants to destroy mankind? Sure. Um, or, you know, are we going to get, you know, jo- uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt finally is Robin? Like, you, you just sure. never know. You just never sure. know. 
Um, but I think it's a step in the right direction. I'm a really big fan of Nolan's first two films, Following and Memento. I think Following is so underrated. Yeah. What well, probably because it is it's so hard to see, probably, but I right. I think following is pretty good. Well, I think if you if you are introduced to Nolan through like Inception, and then you're like, oh, watch this other movie, it's better. You're gonna be like, this is not better. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I think it is. But you see his fingerprints, you see his DNA all over those two movies, but there's no CGI, small casts, you know, not sprawling locations. And it is very cool to see him going from Tenet to this, where Tenet was, I think, you know, please excuse me. I think it's a full regression. I think it's a full regression. Tenet was bad. It's it's bottom. I'm hoping that it's the bottom for him, and he's now starting to make his way out to what I would consider more interesting films. It is definitely just a movie about, you know, a man who has to go against everything to do what's right by the sweat of his brow. And I am bored with stories like that because that is just, you know, the cowboy and the soldier and the mobster, right? Yeah. In America, we love stories about them. They, yeah. it, it hurts them to accomplish what they accomplish. They break the law to accomplish what they, you know, they leave their family, mm-hmm. all of those different things, but by sheer willpower, most of the time, they get the thing done, and they're the hero. This is complicated. He shows how it's complicated. My favorite line in this was from Einstein, where Einstein was like, yeah, and then you know what? One day, they'll serve you salmon and potato salad, and they'll pat you on the back, and it won't be for you. It will be for them. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty, yeah, uh, yeah that's good. So, um, I feel like it's a good cast. Big yes. cast. I feel like Nolan said, get me every quirked up white boy goaded with the sauce who's ever walked the planet. From <laughs> if you if you watch the movie with a with a white man from night from nineteen eighty seven to now, yeah. he's in Oppenheimer. Yeah. Like, I mean there were a lot of moments where I was like, Oh, cool, that guy. Um, Michael Angarano is one of my favorites. He's in one of my favorite movies ever, General Broncos. Um Megan Blair plays his lawyer in the trial, not trial. I was very mm-hmm. excited to see him. Jack Quaid is cool. You know, he, he does the boys and I think he's like severely underused and in that show. So it is cool. I got a shout out friend of the podcast, David Krumholtz. <laughs> oh, and he, you know, he is very much Nolan. He's supposed to be Nolan's like conscience throughout this movie yeah. where, you know, he is also a New York city Jew. He's giving him food on the train. He's, you know, uh, chiding him for knowing all these different languages, but not speaking Yiddish. And he's supposed to be the scientist who's like connecting Nolan to the ground from, you know, floating off into the atmosphere. And throughout the movie, he keeps coming back to like, I don't really think this is a good idea. Or like, I'm not really going to do this. But then even he is just like, yeah, okay, I'll do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's like the conscience that's like, nah, you know what? That actually sounds cool. I'll do it too. Yeah. But it's a great, I mean, it's a great performance. Like you said already, everyone is good in this. I didn't I, buy Josh Hartnett and I love Josh Hartnett. Um, he, he felt stiff as a board to me in this. I think that was the character though. I yeah, think he, I think I think because he's supposed to be kind of just like the non-Jewish all-American man yeah. who is who is conservative, who is anti-union. I I think that that's what kind of what his character called for. Yeah. Uh but uh, I guess uh Casey Affleck is uncanceled now. Uh. <laughs> I had a dude, I had a Casey Affleck jump scare. Whoa, it was and, like, "Oh, and it's almost like Nolan did that on purpose. Purpose, hell because yeah! Because you hear his voice first, and as I'm hearing his voice, I'm like, "That's such a distinctive. Who is this specter from my past?" And I'm hearing it, and I'm like, I'm "Like, I know that I know that voice." You know when um, you're trying to think of a song, but another song is playing. And yeah, it's like, and you have to like turn that one off so that you can <laughs> think of the other one. 
that's what it was like as I was trying to remember, like, like who is this person? And then it comes, you know, the camera comes around on his face and it cuts to his face and it's like, whoa, PC Affleck. Oh, Holy all moly. right. <laughs> Playing, by the way, like a cold blooded, like it, crazy yes. man. <laughs> uh, no, I wrote no, down in no my beard, notes. No beard, no wig. All right. All right. No, nope. I wrote down in my notes. I was like, what a choice for a return of Casey Affleck. He he couldn't be like a like a, a like a nice Jewish boy who wanted to do right in the movie. No, he he wanted to be a, a murdering uh, army guy. Like yeah, all right, like, all right, yeah, a commie hunter. A, he <laughs> not only a commie hunter, the commie yeah, hunter. He's the like, Hans Landa of this movie. <laughs> like this show is like <laughs> Nolan made some fucking choices, boy. Like yeah, oh, it's, it, it, it was pretty it was pretty wild. Um I do wanna point out we already talked about Florence Pugh. Florence Pugh is always great. I think that she's great. I think that she's really underused, as is Emily Blunt. I'm very much on the team of Ooh. Emily Blunt. I, I like a lot of what she does. Whenever somebody she, comes from doing like comedy to drama back to comedy back to drama i'm a big believer in that person yeah here and i i think i can chalk it up to just the direction because almost everyone is cold everyone is very cold Mm -hmm. very sterile even her big moment right in that proceeding whatever you're hearing whatever you want to call it what moment does she like rise to the occasion and like in as far as the story goes, like become the hero and knock it out of the park? It's when she stops being emotional, stops reacting, stops telling Oppenheimer to fight back, and she becomes cold like the lawyer and just like takes him down, but not by being a human being, but by being cold like all yeah. of the other characters. And so I was like, man, it's a cool moment, but at the same time, it's like, can someone in this movie just be <laughs> a normal human being and i think yeah. robert downey jr gets the most of that yeah i mean i mean this is definitely another example of nolan not knowing how to write woman characters like yeah it, it's like i got nothing for you <laughs> i got yeah. nothing for you. i'm I, just I, part of me <laughs> so, honestly at this point like almost feels bad because he, it's such a glaring blind spot in what is a big toolkit of good filmmaking <laughs> yeah it's, yeah it's, it's just like, laughable at this point especially when people called him out on it and he said that oppenheimer has the best love story or the the most love of any movie that he's done you know what i mean and it's like i mean okay. the bars and the bars in hell my guy like 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 the fuck like bro you gave us the worst batman catwoman relationship ever but sure. bro like come yeah. on now like yeah. Yeah. So it did feel like maybe he was like, okay, what do I feel comfortable with? All right. Um, all white men in the desert. <laughs> exactly. Let's focus <laughs> on, <that. laughs> on horses, similar to Ken yes. and yes. Barbie on yes. horses. Yes. I when when Oppenheimer was riding on a horse at one point, I was like, he just couldn't help him. Like it just was like he can't help himself. Like Nolan <laughs> he just he has to do that. It felt very much like Batman in China during Batman Begins, you know, like, yeah. here's here's my guy, cool, in a different place, in a different way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, man. I like... did. I, I know I keep hammering things that I don't like, but that's okay. Whatever. Um, the editing there of this movie is. was driving me crazy, like literally driving me crazy to the point where. So the beginning part of this movie, and I can't tell you when it ends, all I could think was, oh, man, Christopher Nolan watched The Tree of Life. Ah. <laughs> Hilarious. By, um, why is his name escaping me? Terrence Malick? Yeah, by, by Terrence Malick. And that was like the beginning part. You're getting Oppenheimer, and it's quick cutting different time periods. All of these moments where we're seeing atoms i guess and like mini explosions and he's like understanding the secrets of the universe and then we get into the exposition part right which 
uh, what's his name? Alden, Alden Ehrenreich. Alden okay. Ehrenreich was spitting more exposition in a movie than I think I've ever seen before. I mean, he, he was holding hands, boy, to get to point A to point B. <laughs> I was like, all right, okay, he's doing it. But there, I started counting on my fingers, which I know this is horrible, and people are going to say, Seth, just watch the movie. And I did. I would... I was able to like let go and re-enter into just watching mode, but I was literally counting on my fingers. Okay, how long will this shot last? One, two, three. Okay, one, two, three. One, two, three, four. And it was just like cut after cut after cut. And the part where yeah. I noticed it the most was when he first meets with Josh Hartnett. Dude, the camera is not staying on anyone in this movie. Yeah, for them to give a full performance, you know what I mean? Like we're cu- we're moving around, we're cutting back and forth between two different characters. It's like just sit on someone and let them say a bunch of words. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but but the the Oppenheimer story jumps. They're very violent. Like yes. we we like I don't even I can't even count how many years. Like we expand, like before we even get to like 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 that moment, for example, when he meets Hardnet, and then like it's it feels like five minutes later, he Hardnet is like, I'm on I'm on the bomb making team. You yeah. can't be on the team until you get yeah. rid of those fucking commies. He, yeah. Then he's like, all right, cool, I'm in. Like, right. and that happens like that happens very very quickly. Yeah. So yeah, the editing it, it's at it's at breakneck speed. I will say. um, so very quickly, I should have said this probably earlier, but I actually arrived late to the movie. Okay. Um, I was the movie was supposed to start at ten fifteen. At ten o'clock, I realized I was at the wrong movie theater. It was oh. twenty one minutes away. I've done and that. And so and so, I hop on the highway. I'm doing one hundred on ten. I'm, I'm weaving oh, yeah. in and out of traffic. Hearts racing. Whatever. Yeah. I, I finally get there, finally get parking, finally get to the theater, and people are like walking out of the theater. I'm like, what the hell is going on? And they're like, Oh, it's not gonna start for twenty or thirty minutes. And so it's also and and for those that don't know, like the seventy mil IMAX print has been having problems. Uh I oh. I even heard I even heard one theater it didn't it got the ship got lost like the shipping of the film got lost oh. and so whatever whatever reason my screening and actually the the, the theater i saw it in uh, a couple of nights ago it actually had problems with the audio and wow. so when i got there it was 20 30 minutes late and then and so i'm like outside of the theater waiting just for like someone to come by and like gather folks they don't do that. They just start playing the movie and you hear this big ass explosion. And I'm like, okay, I got to find my fucking seat in the dark. And so I missed the first, like, I missed like the first, like five, like three or four minutes of the movie. Sure, sure. And so I'm like trying to catch up, trying to figure out like what's happening. And then that call is kind of like, so to kind of get my bearings of what was going sure. on, whatever. Um, but, but yeah, <laughs> they got to, they got to get these, uh, screenings fix or whatever but even still like it the 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 editing the pacing very quick very fast and i feel like even if i had like seen it from the beginning i still feel like i would have been catching up to just something sure. and trying to figure out like i and like i spent like the biggest part of like the first act trying to figure out i mean i know obviously like what the destination is but still, like, where are we going? Like, what are we supposed to be feeling? Yeah. What is he supposed to be feeling? And so I think, um, I think you know, it's a little bit funny on the editing. I would have liked to see, honestly, like a four and a half hour version of this just to smooth some of that stuff out. I'm mm. not going to advocate for that. But... Oh, oh, so you, you don't want the Nolan cut? You don't want the Nolan I, cut? Dude, Quick sidebar on all of that stuff. Fans need to stop being involved in what artists do. Like, oh, hell yeah. Just shut up. When they changed Sonic because of the outrage, that was the worst thing that could have ever happened. <laughs> yes. Because now fans were like, oh, we have power. And it's yeah. like, what I always say is, it's so hard to get art 
out of your head and into the real world, let alone be made into something that costs millions and millions of dollars and put it in front of people. That process is hard enough. All these people are, they're all artists, you know, lighting technicians and editing. It's all art. There's a lot of, you know, tactical uh, hardware involved in that. There's business involved in it, but it's the business of producing art and someone who is not part of that process should have no say in it. So yeah, yeah, the whole Snyder cut thing, changing Sonic, you know, first reactions to a, a blurry image from a set from two miles away. <laughs> and people are posting a YouTube video, like everything we know so far about Oppenheimer two, like three years yeah. out. It's just, it's disgusting to me. Like leave it alone. I will judge it when I sit there, when I see it. Yeah. That's yeah. actually kind of the reason that's like partial reason. I don't even watch trailers anymore. Yeah. Like, very rarely do I do it. Like trail, like trailer houses, they don't really do service in a lot of ways to the actual film, and, and in some cases, they they're giving you like important plots that you know should we should not have had access to. Like, even, like for example, even like the the Spider Man leaks from the last live action Spider Man movie yeah. where it was leaked that you know Andrew Garfield and Toby were in the movie, like um like. If you were a fan of those movies, imagine how boss it would have felt if you're watching it Thursday, Friday, Saturday, opening night. You have no clue where the movie's going. Right. And then you just see Andrew Garfield pop up in this right. MCU movie. That would have been 10 out of 10 feeling. That would have been like, I cannot believe they actually do it. I'm fully invested. Where the hell is this going? But because people are thirsty as hell, they right. want everyone wants to spoil everything. Right. So now you just have to like put every single thing out there into the universe, whether you want to have it or not. And so, right. so yeah, I think the entitlement for fans is pretty fucking buck wild. So even for Oppenheimer, the final shot of him standing there, there's rain coming onto his fedora. He's got this crazed look in his eye. That's the final shot of this movie. And it was yeah. used in like all of the marketing. What is wrong with you? And <laughs> you might say like, oh, well, that's not a big deal. But when I see something in a trailer, literally the whole movie, I'm like, well, I haven't seen that shot yet. So I know it's coming. <laughs> yeah. You're waiting for it. Like, yeah. Like. Right. And yeah. so then I, then I see it and I'm like, oh my God, why did they show this to me? Like, uh, anyway, that's, that's neither here nor there. So. What I, I don't know, like, all right, how am I going to ask this question? <laughs> Did you have a favorite performance in this movie? I mean, Florence Pugh riding on the bed. Uh, <laughs> uh, but <laughs> um, I, I think it's probably RDJ. I really love okay. Robert, I, and I was I was talking to folks last night, and this really feels not like Robert Downey Jr. being Iron Man, being Louis Strauss. This just sure. feel, it feels like yeah. he just it feels like when he was kind of prophesized in the eighties to be, oh no, he's going to be this special talent that we have for an actor, and then you know obviously life got in the way and it got derailed. This feels like if, if we would have had a time machine in 1988 and we saw this performance back then, we'd be like, oh, he he, he probably has like t- at sure. least two best actor awards already. Sure. And so I, I think I think the levels that he was playing on was really good because he, even in a movie like uh, Zodiac, for example, that doesn't really feel like he's a reporter like who stumbled on this like mass murder it just feels like robert downey jr who happens to be a performer who stumbled onto this mass murder mm-hmm. so uh i i thought his his performance was really great and i i think i think he definitely well i don't want to say definitely but i think he has a chance of getting nominated for best supporting actor sure i would oh, say yeah. i would say killian murphy is going to get nominated for best lead yeah i, um, I don't see he, how he can't yeah yeah um so i thought he i thought those two performances is really good uh, even though emily blunt didn't really get much she kind of maximized 
her limitedness or, or her limited character, I would say. Uh, but I would say those who for sure are going to have nominations. Um, who was who was your favorite performance, or did you even have one? I I was really hoping for Killian to have more. Like he's he's in this movie. He's yeah. good in this movie, and he's he's got tons of screen time. We're seeing him with old age makeup and young black hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's on the mop um, top some. Yeah, and so it it's it's good, but it's nowhere near what I had heard people say that it was. Um, he, this movie, and this is gonna sound really crazy. This movie, I think, is structured like Walk the Line. <laughs> wow. I mean... Infidelity. I mean, just... Yeah, yeah, there yeah. There so many points in this movie, you know, hearing the people stomping their feet, and there were so many things where I was like, this is Walk the Line. This is just Walk the Line for science nerds. Anyway. Hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> and so <laughs> Killian Murphy, I think, is doing his very best... You know, Walking Phoenix doing Johnny Cash uh, in this yeah. movie, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I think Walk the Line is a is a great movie. Um, I, I was really taken with Macon Blair as his lawyer. I already mentioned that. I'm a mm -hmm. big fan of his. If anyone hasn't seen Blue Ruin, you have to see Blue Ruin. It's one of the better, more realistic movies about revenge ever made. Uh, he's also great in Green Room. You know, as a white supremacist dude. And here he's just so he's not over the top. He's not like angry. He's not like throwing his pad across the table, but he's put into this very unjust situation. He's doing his best, but he know it it's like just going through the motions. Like he knows like there's literally nothing that we can do. And there's a moment where he gets up and just walks over and sits next to Oppenheimer on the bench. And it's like, it's, it's really great. So I really liked him. Um, can I can I tell can I tell you a, a real sicko guest appearance from, sure. from Nolan? Sure. Uh, so I guess his daughter uh, Flora Nolan is in this yes. movie yeah. as a burn victim. Like yes. what the fuck, bro? Like yeah. if, if anything, that's the last person who I want to cast as a fucking burn victim well, in yeah. fucking Oppenheimer. If, if if it felt like him trying to make it personal and like. It's almost like, well, I'm not going to show you the devastation, but I'm going to put my own daughter in it so that you know that I really feel something about it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, hey, I do care. I put my daughter in here. What I thought you were going to mention, and this was like, this was, talk about a jump scare. Gary Oldman. As Harry oh. Truman. <laughs> I didn't <laughs> recognize him at first. I didn't recognize him. I didn't I recognize knew, him. I knew it was someone in there, and all I had to do was go to the Christopher Nolan, you know, cast of characters. <laughs> the in the my roster. Head. Yeah, and I was like, Hilarious. oh my God, they are doing. Which is so funny because you just had him, you know, in um, The Darkest Hour as the British dude. Um, shit. Wait, wait, wait. Thank you, Letterboxd. Winston Churchill. Yeah. You just had him on the other side of World War II. And so they're like, hey, you know who could play an old bald guy in World War II? Get Gary Oldman in here to do that. Um, it was That part was okay. But yeah. Um, so to me, the, the, small, the small parts of this movie are what kind of glued it and made me more interested in it. David Krumholtz, uh, even Benny Safdie, um, that was a pleasant guy surprise. Who's, yeah, obsessed with the hydrogen bomb. <laughs> like, Jesus Christ. God. Rami Malik. Uh, until the very end, I was like, "Why is Rami Malik in this movie? Like, what is going on here?" And then, <laughs> yeah, you know, he kind of saves the day. Um, but yeah, I just yeah. So I, I'd probably say them. So one thing we haven't, I guess, ultimately, we're kind of skirting around. We're talking about like the craftsmanship. We're talking about like the actual acting of the movie and we, we kind of just oppose that to kind of the faults of the movie. Mm -hmm. 
But ultimately, is this a successful Nolan movie? And how does this kind of stack within this filmography? I think I sometimes when you when you when you're critical, right? More critical in a negative way of a movie. I feel like people only hear what they want to hear. And mm-hmm. so I hope that I'm being clear. This movie is very effective. Like I said, when yeah. I left the theater, I was like in a daze, you know. It, it's very good at making you think about the morals, making you think about what he did, what he meant. Doesn't provide answers, I don't think. But True. Okay, that's fine. You know, whatever. I think apart from the crazy editing (laughs) and perhaps some of the character directing, you know, the acting directing, I think that it works on all levels. I I think that it's a great movie. Like I, I said to my wife, this is a good example of a great movie that I don't really like that much, but I can Mm. separate the two things and say, Oh yeah, this is a great movie. I think anytime you make a movie that's three hours, three and a half hours, four hours long, even like Avatar, you know, the second Avatar movie, I don't care for that movie at all. It's still a feat of movie making. It still should be listed among big epics and pushing the boundaries of CGI and all that stuff. I I didn't like the movie at all. (laughs) And that's kind of how I feel about Oppenheimer. It's like, I'll never see this movie again. I can tell you that much. Oh, I don't know. I th- I'm, I'm I'm never want to catch it. <laughs> I think I want to catch it while it's still in theaters one more time. Sure, I think I am. So, I think it's a success. I think Nolan he told the story. I think he I think he does it. As far as his filmography, I hope, like I said, that this is a step in a more aggressively non CGI uh, direction for him. Yeah. Where, like I said, Tenet was just, it was rough. Yeah. It was all spectacle and almost nothing else. Although, John David Washington in that movie is so funny to me. Everyone thinks that he's, like, Ooh. boring and bland in that. I thought, I was like, this guy's cool, man. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. And Robert Pattinson. I, I thought the two of them were were great in that movie. But, yeah. I, I, oh, hope, that, I-, I hope that this is a step in in the right direction that he's maybe coming down to earth a little bit with his filmmaking i would love to see him next do an hour and a half to an hour and 45 little thriller oh spy thriller a little thriller hell no like if you if you can't go in the space of fuck up time <laughs> nolan don't got no time for you buddy Just i'll tell you what christopher nolan does um I, I don't even know jack the ripper just give me that Jack the Ripper. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, Nolan, if you cannot figure a way to bend the space time continuum, <laughs> right? Like, he, he's just not interested. He, he's right. not getting out of bed for that. Uh, right. So, I, I think the movie is ultimately successful, even with his faults. I, like I said, I think he has a moment that's the best of his career, mm-hmm. but. I, I, I this is not his best his best movie overall, but it is is it's a definite rebound from Tenet. Um, and I mean, I would say I w- uh, the the Dark Knight mm-hmm. Rises kind of is is aging like worse as as kind of kind of time goes sure. on. Yeah. I when I was in the movie theater and I saw Dark Knight Rises, I was so it so like engrossed with Robert uh Tom sorry with Tom Hardy's performance. Yeah. That I was like, oh yeah, this is better than Dark Knight. Like this is like the best shit ever. And then like I'm looking at the I looked at the shit like this year and I was like only Hardy only only he works. Only yeah. Bane works and nothing yeah. else is just really worth it. Yeah. Um I think Oppenheimer it's I would say probably middle upper tier, but not like top top tier sure. so but it is definitely a rebound from tenet it's I, I would say it's it's better than dark knight rises and i mean he's still accomplished enough that i'm interested 
to see what he does next. Like I, I have faults with him. I have faults with, you know, especially him. It, it, it really kind of came across as if he wanted us to die to watch Tenet, which yes, no, which like, by the way, I almost did. I traveled an hour and a half to go to the only theater in the area that was playing it. And I was like, I'm really about to die to see this movie. Yeah, man. Like, he, <laughs> And then it, it was he, over and I was like, for that? For that, yeah. Nolan? Come on, bro. Like, you did me dirty with that, bro. <laughs> he, did, he, he did people's lungs dirty with that yeah. fucking movie. And so, yeah. So, I, uh, yeah, man. I, and that really really like not Nolan down pegs for me. And and it's actually it's actually kind of funny. I was thinking about the idea of how he could have just had goodwill with that movie. Because if you think about like what he did with Tenet versus what Tom Cruise did with Top Gun Maverick. And obviously we have like a lot of cachet. We have a lot of history with Tom Tom Cruise. He's been an A lister for literally like three decades basically. But even him at least giving a shit about people's health on his crew. Like, mm-hmm. like when the, like that, that audio leaked of him kind of berating the cast on one hand, you know, as a, you know, uh, as an anti-capitalist, I severely disliked it, but I can, even the idea of you have a boss that is at least trying to have people be responsible with their health in a time when, no one knew what the fuck was going on with this shit. Like everyone was scared. No one had any like real answers. At least you have a person who is trying to have like true accountability. Now, was it to make, you know, billions of dollars? It was, but that's, <laughs> well, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> but, right. uh, but at least it was someone that was like, he at least cares enough for his crew and he cares enough to entertain folks that, he is trying to be as safe as possible when Nolan was like, no, nah, y'all need to get your asses in this theater. Cause I got, I I'm starring my, my movie with my first black lead with no name. So get your asses to the fucking movies right now. <laughs> like, it was like, bro, like this, like Tenet was not, <laughs> Tenet was not the sacrifice he wanted it to right. be. So, right. Right. but, um, but I get, I guess he's back. I guess Casey Affleck's back. Uh, so. I guess you white men are back. Hey, like, <laughs> like Oppenheimer says, you can't keep a good man down. <laughs> Jesus Christ. But you can give his baby away and not ever oh have to answer God. for it. <laughs> yo, they, they passed that baby like a cold. Like, they were like, yo. And the dude was just like, Ah, don't worry about it. It's fine. Kids are crazy, man. You come on. He was, yo, get out of here. <laughs> he was like, your 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 brain and your intellect is worth more than this little cheap ass baby yeah. about to bring us. Yeah, like, that's man. that was crazy. Know? Yeah, he's so, a man's he's life so... isn't measured by you know the people that are in it. It's measured by what he accomplishes. Don't we know that by now? <laughs> Or, or, or metric tons of yes, destruction. Exactly. Yeah, so, exactly. <laughs> yeah, man. This, this, like, this movie is funny as shit, man. When you, think, when you, like, really think about this movie, it's funny as shit, man. Like, this dude ratted out his friend. This dude got his... his <laughs> he ratted out his friend. He ratted out unions. He's a, he ratted yeah, out man. commies. Like, yeah. yo. And he's yeah. having all these affairs the whole time. <laughs> He's like he's fucking all he's fucking married women. He's like you bringing know, all these flowers that just get thrown into the bin. Like, come on, man! Like, <laughs> come on, come on, Nolan. We we don't have to like J. Robin I behind. We don't have to <laughs> like him, my guy. Like, holy shit! Like, also at the end when he gets uh, the medal, um, Oppenheimer died of uh, cancer. You know, he was only he was in his early sixties. And throughout the movie, when they keep showing him in aged makeup, I was like, isn't he only like 10 years older than Killian Murphy is right now? Like, did he really look that poorly? So he died when he was 63. Um, yeah. So 62. So uh, I guess so, man. I guess so. Man. Because <laughs> they were making him look like an 80-year-old man with that age-old makeup in the end. Yeah, I might get well. So I don't know when he. Uh, I'll 
I don't know when he actually got the medal, um, but uh, that would. Oh, he got that in '63. So four years later, he was out of here. Right. <laughs> I sound very callous when I said that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but fuck him. Um, so. <laughs> you know who I really liked in this movie, and I didn't expect to like. I really liked Einstein because you got Einstein, oh, yeah. who's just there, and he's just like, you know what? I don't like math. I don't like looking at papers. I don't like Robert Downey Jr. I'm just here, but I am not here. Good luck out in the desert. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna go. Uh, I don't know. Walk through the woods. I guess he said, "Take this." He said, "Take this paper. I don't want to hold it no more." Like, yeah, he, he literally like, was like, "That's yours, not mine." <laughs> yo, I felt, I felt you, my dog. I, I yeah. felt you. Yeah, Einstein's like, "Oh, you guys are gonna blow up the whole world? I don't want yeah. anything to do with this." Please take my fingerprints off this evidence of <laughs> this evidence of death. Please. I was waiting for them to call Einstein into the room. They were calling in everyone throughout the whole movie. Basically. Me and Einstein be like, "Yeah, I never cared for him." <laughs> this, yeah, this guy's a fucking commie. <laughs> next, <laughs> next question. Well, we just asked your name, sir. He's a commie. That's my right. name. He is a commie. Right. So, um, is there anything that we didn't talk about that you wanted to mention? I I guess one of the, I guess on a personal note, one of the things I'm really committed to is catching movie movies on film whenever I can. Sure. Um I just think that you, you really cannot be film quality versus digital and I think kind of around the mid 2010s or early 2010s basically when like everyone like movie theaters and like television just did the full pivot from film to digital and so i'm you know 90 well it's not 100 percent. well 99 percent. like your favorite movie from the 90s was shot on film 80s 70s 60s 50s all that was shot on film and so i've been kind of going to like different well in, in different cities like Austin and LA to kind of catch movies when I could. It's actually showing on film. Uh, I think the quality much richer, much warmer, much more greater experience. And so seeing Oppenheimer in 70 mil print, um, it, it was like a cheat code. It was, it was every yeah. shot was, every shot was beautiful. Uh, every, every aspect of it just, it looked great. Um, I don't want to be like prison in a moment, again but i i think that what he did with this movie from a technical aspect it is probably the best or at least some of the best of his career like i i think um i think everything is shot and photographed pretty lovely and and i think that's the reason that i do want to see this again in theaters because i mean they're even having problems with the screenings for film now so this is not a guarantee that we'll ever get this shown or s- screened on film like again. Right. Uh, and, and that sounds like, you know, pretty, I would say like dire, but um, I, it, if you can, I would highly recommend catching it on film, even for folks who've listened to this and had the shit spoiled. Uh, if you, <laughs> I, I would say I, I would definitely recommend, obviously like there's, there's plenty of great digital theaters, like AVX, whatever. Um, but the film experience is pretty second to none. And I would say even beyond just Oppenheimer, if you live in a city with a film theater and they have film screenings, especially like your local independent theaters, um, I would say try to make plans to go catch it if you can. Um, Cause it's, it's much, much, much more different than watching it on your 4k or your flat screen tv i know you're, i know your setup is comfortable at home but get your ass out the house safely if you can <laughs> and mingle with the folks and yeah and, and you have a meta moment like i did when a guy next to me is clapping for death so yeah, that's right there it is there that's it is right. <laughs> like that's, well that's hey thanks man i appreciate you taking your time to come on and talk about this movie so where no where can problem. people find you what about your show uh for our podcast we should do this again sometime it is me uh the mark rob and also cat chinetti so 
Uh, we're kind of taking a summer break. We're going to come back in the fall. And for the season that we're going to, for the season that we finished, we went over top 100 AFI. Uh, we picked, yeah. uh, we picked some good movies. We evaluated to see if they are still holding up to 2023. And for next season, we're going to be looking at Oscar winners and to oh. see if they actually hold up in 2023 also. Uh, so, yeah, so we, we really try to bridge the gap between the past and the present. And uh, we, in some movies, we play a little game called uh, Counter Problematic, Hella Problematic, or Burn yes. is Problematic. Yes. Uh, so, for example, Indiana Jones, Temple of Doom, uh we watched it and burn this problematic it's, sure. it's 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 kind of buck wild but sure that's my um, favorite one <laughs> I, and, and the and i i i heard you actually say that on yeah. one of your episodes before and the funny is like that's actually the one that i grew up on like oh, temple really? of doom was the temple of doom i've watched in my lifetime probably two dozen times as wow. a kid wow. and so yeah like and so when you're that young, you don't really know that, uh, or or uh, you don't really pick up on, you know, kind of the, the weird ways that the movie kind of operates. Sure. Uh, then when you're an adult, you're like, oh wow, these uh, dark skinned people, they're getting uh, fairly maligned in this movie. All yes, right, absolutely. all right, Steven, all right, Stevie. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but um, but yeah, man, uh, you can if you want to catch us on Twitter, you can follow me at showing that love, S H O. W I N M A D L V and for our show pod uh uh at cat and mark uh K A T A N D M A R C. So there it is. Awesome. <laughs> well thanks again, man. This is a good talk. And despite everything that I said in this episode, I think that this is a good to great movie and hopefully people don't um, you know, run us out of town on a rail for our <laughs> problems Hilarious. with it <laughs> Hilarious. sometimes well, though you know you just got to be the dissenting voice in the sea you got to be the david crumholtz of the movie before you know signing up to also just do the bad thing well <laughs> well well seth where can the people catch you oh yeah, everywhere man if look if I, if your twitter feed isn't if isn't littered with me replying to people about movies do you even follow me that's my question Hilarious. I was trying to tee you up for people that don't, but okay. <laughs> hey, Movie Friends Podcast. Everywhere, pretty much. Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. You can also send us an email, moviefriendspodcast at gmail.com. Let us know what you thought about Oppenheimer. I finished out Oppenheimer and Barbie this weekend. I did not do them in the same day, and we did episodes on both, so I'm ready to go to sleep. There it is. There it is. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for listening. Have a good one.